Is that working now? Yeah. All right. So I'm just not that good with technology. That's not, that's not good. <laughs> it's not a good start. So um, I actually slightly changed the topic of the talk for today. And uh, it's just called getting shit done with Jekyll, right? So uh, we're going to talk a little bit. Well, I'm going to jump right into it. So um, I'm going to give you some context really quickly about myself and uh, my company, obviously. Yeah, shameless plug. Um, Basically, my company um, mostly work with uh, large organizations, mostly with innovations, uh, innovation and, and uh, um, digital teams. And we help them create digital products. Um, we do that solely with very large brands. Uh, so you may have heard with some of those guys. Um, and um, today, I'll actually mention some of the stuff from uh, some of the work that we've done with Starbucks, for example, uh, and more recently with Zalando. Um, but yeah, all, mostly just large brands building things at scale and helping them develop the product culture. Um, what is it, it, concretely, it means mostly that we're actually doing omnichannel. Um, we're doing omnichannel with, uh, with those brands that I talked about before, and uh, mostly just like coming in, helping them in both the Chinese and European market, develop mobile, web, um, and, and hardware um, uh, experiences for their customers, and then just tracking the heck out of this uh, across all channels. Um, and we do that at, at actually at scale. So I actually was having a chat with your uh, colleague over there from Contentful earlier. Uh, so for example, Starbucks, we have like between 20 and 40 million users, uh, depending on the channel. Uh, Walmart is like similar scale. Um, so it's, it's fun when you put, uh, you know, you uh, switch it on and you directly have like 10 to 20 million users that are rushing to your website. That's, that's the interest of having static websites with uh, the least amount of stuff that breaks. Uh, myself, I'm the chief janitor officer, um, aka the CEO. I do whatever shit is necessary for my team to actually execute and, uh, and not die doing it um, and, and hopefully set some kind of direction for the company. But I, I generally see myself as the, uh, the chief janitor officer, right? I'm, I'm here to do any kind of thing that is not taken care of by the team yet. So if we're really weak on, on business development or sales at, at some point, I'm going to do that. If HR is actually starting to not work so well anymore, then I jump on doing this. Do you even Jekyll? So a little bit of cred. Um, I've actually used Jekyll for quite a while. Um, I've started using it, I think, in 2009. I switched um, from back then. I was using mostly Drupal and WordPress, I know. Uh, and I switched over to, uh, to, to Jekyll. Uh, back then, was uh, I think it was just like the first kind of like GitHub pages support, I discovered that and uh, I loved it. Like instantly, I thought it was like a, a great idea. And, uh, and I've been building a lot of websites since, since then. Uh, with like uh, more recently, some of the brands that you may know, obviously my, our own websites that I'll show uh, later on, uh, but um, also some stuff with uh, Starbucks, right? Mobile and desktop type of experiences. And uh, very recently, launching in the next week or two for Zalando that you guys may have heard of. Um, why even Jekyll? So just a little bit of context as to at least where I'm coming from when using uh, Jekyll and why we use it. Um, again, as I said, I, I used to work a lot with Drupal to the point that actually I was uh, sitting on the, uh, the nonprofit association that is managing the, um, all the money on, on behalf of the community. I was very involved in it. I had like very active profile, I was doing a lot of uh, work with you know, contributions, but also being involved in all the conferences and, and the events. Um, and, you know, you know, over the years, apart from the direction of the project as a whole, I decided, you know, I, I realized that um, traditional CMSs like WordPress and, 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 and Drupal and, um, and maybe Type 3 or whatever else you have out there, Plone, um, were actually trying to solve two problems at the same time, both the site generation and the content administration. And those are two very different problems to solve. And the main, the main issue that I have is, is most of them are actually doing a mediocre job at both. And, and it's, it's very hard actually to, to, to do both really, really well. And I don't think any of them is really nailing it. Um, they also tend to, to break and get hacked, right? So um, if you're one of the unfortunate person who's able, uh, ever administrated a, uh, let's say a Joomla website, uh, <laughs> you're very familiar with that. Um, and, 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 you know, databases that go down for no reason, uh, middle, of the, middle of, the, uh, of a campaign or middle of the night. Um, and overall, they, they're really hard to customize, honestly, for especially the front end experience. You end up having to bending frameworks 
uh, backward to really make it what, what you want to do, especially in, in a lot of cases where it's actually pretty simple. Um, so, you know, I like simple tech. Um, I like separation, separation of concern, right? Set generation and, and, and other stuff. Um, and uh, I also love Liquid, actually. I was talking about it with some of my engineers this afternoon. I really love uh, Liquid. I think it's, it's great templating engine. Um, so moving on. Um, so how do I get shit done? Uh, and I'm mostly going to try and go through all the points of, you know, the things that I'm trying to uh, encourage my team to do when they are actually building a, a Jekyll website. I'm sure a lot of this is actually pretty obvious, but hopefully we have a, you know, back and forth, like some Q&A. Um, uh, some of it is maybe less obvious or uh, uh, less known from some of you. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, the first thing is installing stuff. So that sounds like a uh, really weird uh, thing to bring on the, uh, on, on, a, on a meetup for uh, static websites. I mean, I would assume some of you have already done this, but, but Ruby kind of suck. And, and I can't count the number of times where people came to me and say, hey, I can't fucking make it work uh, somehow. Um, there's, a, there's a gen that is missing or Jekyll is just not, not building it. Uh, Ruby kind of suck for dependencies. You have to know that. And, and really, I would encourage you to not fuck around. Don't even follow any tutorial out there. Just Check the version of Ruby. If it's not the right version, upgrade. And as soon as you have the right version of Ruby, then just sudo gem install GitHub pages, and that's all. Do not do anything else. Do not try anything else. Um, so rule number one, and that's going to be a theme across the whole presentation, is just keep things simple. Uh, most important thing, actually, in my humble opinion, um, avoid things, um, avoiding any shit that you really don't need, right? So for example, I don't use Webpack, I don't use Gulp, I don't use bun Bundle, I, I don't use any, any uh, dependency management system uh, if I can uh, get away with just a make file, for example, right? Um, I, I avoid multiplying layouts. Um, if I can just dump some logic, some liquid logic directly in a page in the JQ website, I just do that and, and you, know, you get away with it really easily. Um, and, you know, I tend to use vanilla JavaScript unless there's a real reason for using something else, in which case I usually don't use jQuery. And uh, very simple SaaS. Um, and, and obviously, saying no to your client or to your colleagues is, is always an option. Like, why do you need that? Do you really need that? No, I don't want to implement that. All right. The first thing that I usually do is starting with a proper information architecture, right? So you got to go and define, obviously, what your collections are. And obviously, most of you guys are familiar. But it's not always clear to people what collections and, and pages are. And there's a little bit of like, you know, confusion there. More importantly, people tend to underutilize data. Right? So if there's no single individual page for that item, it's most likely a good candidate for actually using just the data folder. Right? For those of you who are not familiar, you can actually dump all kind of YAML and CSV files into underscore data. And you can then access it through the, the, the site.data variable. It's pretty awesome, really. Uh, so if I, I'll get to this later on, but basically I have some examples for this. Um, and clues are really cool. Um, and again, most people are just using it in a really dumb way to just like add some HTML that they want to go and drop into their page. But you can do a little bit more than that. Um, obviously, there's like reusable code, like SEO stuff, like all the stupid like Twitter cards and uh, 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 whatever, open graph stuff from Facebook that you don't want to rewrite over and over again. Um, but I, I use it as well as like more or less like function. Um, so when I want to, for example, use the same kind of teaser structure for many items across my website, I just use like a, a liquid template for that, uh, an include uh, file for this, and I just pass on some variables to it because you can actually do that as I mentioned here. Um, and in many cases as well, I use it to, um, to build some helpers. Um, and I'll, I'll get to this in more details at the end, but especially for translation, um, and I use it as well for manipulating like uh, paths and figuring out where in the site I am. I'm actually like building like a little collection of like little helpers um, that I'm just loading in the page when I need them. I'll get to this later on. Um, and again, like remember that actually you share, um, the, the scope is uh, actually shared between includes and, and the page itself. So if you define a variable into an include, uh, you actually can find it later on in the page, right? So that means you can use those little helpers to assign a variable, and we'll get to this later on. Um, so yeah, that's typically kind of like how I would use it for, um, for multilingual support, where I would just declare um, a T variable, and then later on, um, I would actually go and load that thing right at the top. So you can see that I18N little like um, helper that I'm loading. I have another one that is called path. Uh, I don't think I'm talking about it today. 
Um, by the way, all those things are actually available in an open source repo that I'll link at the end. Uh, so you can just go and see how I structure most of my projects. Um, all right, so configuration. Obviously, sensible defaults. There's a bunch of things that somehow don't really work the same on GitHub pages that I'd like to just, you know, get out of the way. Like, for example, permalinks. Um, I hate the .html pages uh, that they have by default. Um, but, um, you know, setting up as well, like, you know, uh, default templates for drafts and, and things of that kind. And I override the heck out of this, uh, especially for everything that is related to development, staging. We usually even deploy different config files, uh, depending on the branch, when we build the websites. Um, and so you just, just know that you can actually override, um, override your settings, right? And usually that looks like this. Um, you have like that huge default configuration. You can override it uh, with like just basically nullifying things like, I don't, I don't load Google Analytics on my local, especially since I live most of the time in China. So Google Analytics isn't necessarily the, the, the fastest. Um, so just like setting it to files or um, just, you know, overriding um, the URL. Um, yeah. and. Usually I use configuration to capture any kind of like site wide settings. So I tend to, again, overuse uh, includes and little templates. Um, one thing that is interesting that I only notice when I started to build like really large websites is to avoid fucking around too much with the default um, attribute, especially when you start to have a lot of files, uh, things can get really slow when you start to define default values for them. So try and avoid doing that. Um, I literally cut the, 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 the um, build time by, by half when I actually stop doing that on starbucks.com.cn. Um, next thing, I fucking hate plugins. I never use plugins. Plugins have let me down like many times. They're really evil. Um, not all of them are bad, but a lot of them are really poorly written or not super fast, and they can make things really much slower. I realized just working on this, um, again, on like some large websites that even the sitemap module that you would assume is just like pretty well optimized can make things like significantly slower. I mean like, you know, 30% 30, 30 or more slower on some websites. Um, also, they, they, most of them, apart from like a few that are supported on GitHub pages are, are just not gonna work. Uh, and I like to have things working on GitHub pages because, you know, I'm a cheap bastard and I don't like to pay for hosting. And uh, they don't really solve problems that you can't solve with either vanilla JavaScript or some little bit of JavaScript, uh, I mean, uh, vanilla JavaScript or, or, or just vanilla Jekyll, right? And in some cases, you can't solve it with, that, with, with those two things. You can still use like a third party and do it actually better than using some kind of weird um, custom plugins. Um, all right, so let's talk about multilingual support. That's usually the part that's a little bit more complicated. It's a little bit of a brain fuck, honestly, in most cases. Um, so um, as I said, I don't like plugins. And I've tried a lot of plugins for multilingual support. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm work, working mostly in China. And so almost all of our sites are at least bilingual. Um, and you know, we have to, to give that uh, you know, uh, off, off, um, out the box, right? So um, we, we work a lot with IET and internationalization. Uh, that usually means two things. Um, obviously, multilingual content, so when you're writing a whatever page block post, you need to be able to translate it, but also localization. So you need to be able to have elements of navigation, elements of like message, um, error messages, for example, you may have in a form to be able to translate it. Um, those two things um, I actually saw by, oh, well, first I declare the languages in my configuration. Um, and then I keep translating things in, in, in separate files, right? So I have a subfolder in underscore data for all my translation, one per, uh, one per language. Um, and then I have some liquid magic in one of those little files that I'm actually loading in most pages uh, that allows me to just declare a, a T function that just gives me access to my translated strings. Um, and then in that same file, I actually also declare the current language as being lang. So all I have to do in most, page, most pages is actually do uh, T lang and then the name of the value that I have. So as you can see, that's, that's the code that loads it. And uh, yeah, I do a lot of like tlang apply form title and so on and so forth. And that gives me, that gives me the, the string in the local language. Pretty standard stuff. Multilingual content. It's a, a little, bit more little bit more weird. Um, so all the content that I actually declare on the website needs to have a lang attribute by default. Um, but, and, and all the content that is at the root uh, especially for pages, like at the root is actually default language. So if the first language in your array is English, then it's gonna be English. Um, but, um, and, and I have subfolder for 
all the pages that are not uh, that are not like default language. So you may have like a subfolder for uh, uh, German would be de slash about.md, for example, for the about page. Um, things get a little bit more uh, fucked up with the collections. Uh, you have to go and um, not only have those subfolders, but they're pretty much transparent to, uh, to collections. Uh, Jekyll doesn't really see the subfolders. So you need to find another way to kind of like trick it into being able to build those URLs that are for separate languages, which in my case is like, you know, slash DE, for example, and anything afterwards is, is, is the, the URL of, of the, the content in German. Um, so you have to double the language with a categories attribute uh, that matches the same value and only for the uh, non-default language, right? Which is always fun, right? The reason for that, as I said, is like first it's invisible um, to, uh, to, the folders are invisible to, uh, for collections when you're building the, uh, the permalinks. Um, you, you can't use as well um, custom attributes in the permalinks. So you can't use lang into your permalink, uh, unfortunately. Um, and um, you, you may still want to be able to use actually the category attributes, right? So I end up having like both categories and category. And I usually set the language to categories because the way that Jekyll works is that they, they put, you know, they merge those two arrays and categories goes first, category goes right after. But they're both actually valid, um, valid attribute to be able to define categories of your post. So a li little bit hackish. Um, it's a little bit weird, uh, but it, it kind of work. And I'm able to just like, you know, build anything really um, from like list of posts uh, to, uh, to pages, to localizing any part of the website. Um, and to be honest, most of that shit, I never have to touch because uh, the, the, the CMS is actually obfuscating most of that. And I don't really see it um, uh, half the time. Um, so that's an example like of localized content, right? As you can see uh, for the English version, I only have Lang. And for the Chinese version, I have both categories and length having the value of the, uh, of the locale. Um, all right, and so what is this? Uh, yeah, again, like same, same kind of stuff, but with like how I actually go and build a K. Oh, this is the menu for starbucks.com.cn. So you can see I'm actually uh, setting up those little uh, uh, includes that I talked about earlier, which sets all the localization stuff. And then um, I'm just filtering the product probably somewhere. There you go by uh, the language, the current language. All right, um, last point of this presentation, um, talking about like making things a little bit more dynamic for Jekyll. Um, quite honestly, when I talk to my clients, most of the time I don't say static generator anymore because they understand this as like, oh, I can't edit or do anything with it. So I tend to say just side generator and then just leave that for the professionals. Uh, and there's definitely room for actually making things a lot more dynamic on a website, right? At least the way that a, an average user would understand it. So the first thing, and sorry, that's a competitor. <laughs> it's open source, but uh, it's, a, a, it's a little uh, uh, CMS that I wrote. Um, it's really tiny. It doesn't do half of what Contentful does, uh, but it, it does do the trick for most of my needs. Um, and uh, it, it's basically just a very simple view application. Uh, and so if you go, for example, on our, um, on our company website here and uh, you would just go and enable it, uh, you would see it popping up at the bottom here. And if I go to a blog post, for example, and uh, decide that I want to edit this post, I'm able to just go and go there, edit this page. And instead of having like, you know, a pretty dry GitHub page where I need to figure out what are even the fields in the first place, I have that little view that is kind of a form it's a little bit easier. It's got a couple of things that are you know, a little bit more helpful to know who's been editing what and you can easily rename and move files and you can easily just upload pictures and whatnot. So not terribly complicated, uh, but it, it does solve most of the problems. And obviously there were other alternatives out there. None of them was actually supporting what I mostly need for most of my clients, which is not there because posts are not multilingual. But if you go on the front page, it is going to be multilingual. And so what I need to have is the ability of actually managing translations. And so most, most of the other CMSs, we're not doing it. And I'm not going to try and teach the world like categories and lang brain fuck to any of my clients. They're going to mess it up. I mess it up most of the time. Um, so you can go out there, check it out. It's very simple, but it does the trick. Um, the second thing uh, to make things more dynamic that usually people ask for is, is search. So I've tried, actually, we used to use a lot of like Algolia and similar services that I really liked. 
but then somehow things got like a lot more complicated in the later versions and i just can't even fucking understand how most people edit um things it's, it's really hard unless you have a paying account you really get any value out of those systems anymore um and that forced me to use something that i had had my eyes on for quite a while which is linear.js which is fucking awesome it's a tiny library that does you know like elastic search but a lot simpler obviously but it allows you to do uh, just basically full text search engine ish in the browser um, so the only thing that you have to do usually is just build the index and so you can build a very simple view uh, a very simple template in, in Jekyll build like a JSON view of that or directly load that into a JavaScript file and as soon as you have that content you can just like you know point lunar at it add a little bit of logic and and voila you have a service that you can call locally and that's going to give you those results and then you can template it and make it beautiful. Um, it's really reducible in the sense that we use it, for example, for our playbook, right, which is our, our public playbook. Um, it's really fast. So even when you compare it to um, any other plugin out there, because it's already loaded in the front end, it's got a great experience for most people, right? And obviously um, we do it as well for more complex use cases, like for example, uh, the Starbucks menu for the Chinese website, um, where, you know, if I do, obviously this, um, it's a little bit slow because it's hosted in China, but um, it, it works in Chinese. We actually wrote a, uh, because obviously Chinese isn't that easy to, to support, but you can add a tokenizer. So we just have a pre-built step that helps us basically make Lunar work. But definitely if you want to do search, check out Lunar, it's great. It's really easy to implement. Um, for more complex stuff, um, really just rely on like any third party service that you can first. Um, so that's, you know, contentful for the CMS. Uh, that's, you know, what, whatever else you want to use, for example, for resizing pictures. Um, I personally love Zapier. Um, I really love it. I think it's a great product. Um, we've, we've used it to do a ton of like really simple automation and I'll show you what we do, for example, in a, in a little while. If it doesn't work and you need something a lot more custom, um, I would consider you build first a microservice and try and keep it as lean and simple as possible. You can deploy it on now. Um, I don't know if you guys know from Zite. It, it's really great. Uh, you can, I actually use that to do the OAuth login for um, the Jekyll Plus CMS. Um, it, it's really not that much code and it, it gets the job done. And if you don't, then just go write your own fucking backend, right? Um, at that stage, you can just deploy it on whatever, on your own servers, on Heroku, on whatever you, you feel like. Um, and then embedding um, tiny web apps across the website, which is usually what we do, which is what we've done for Starbucks and other people. Um, React or Vue.js. My engineers love React. I kind of hate it. I, I think it's overcomplicated in many cases. I tend to love Vue, especially if you come from a more HTML, JavaScript, regular kind of thing. If you don't jQuery before, it's great. It, it's really easy to understand. Uh, you get shit done and uh, it's really not in the way. Um, and as usual, just like saying no is, is a total valid answer. And I say that to my clients all the time. I don't always win, but I try really, really hard to push back on like any kind of like, could we do this? Yeah, we could, but it sucks. So let's not do it. All right, so quick example with a form. Um, I think it's a good illustration on how you can take a static website and with almost no effort, you can actually add like a very simple common need, which is like, oh, well, I need a form. You don't need a specific service for that. I use really a simple HTML form. Um, I then have like, you know, on a website, we have to be able to submit resumes. So I just use S3, which just set up a bucket, um, S3 bucket, and basically just a, not a few lines of code. Uh, it, the API is not so nice to interact with, but just some code to be able to just basically uh, allow people to asynchronously uh, uh, submit a push a file in, in, in that bucket. It's a public bucket, so obviously you could go and do nasty things with it, but not too worried about it. If we really get some abuse at some point, I'll add a microservice. Um, but now, not needed. Um, and then once you submit the form, uh, it just basically takes that reference to the file upload and all the rest of the fields, and I just send that to a Zapier webhook, right? So you can define a webhook, and then what's magical after this is that you can connect it to whatever the fuck you want. You can create it like, you know, Google Docs, you can just, connect to whatever service you've actually hooked up with, which um, we actually used to, um, to go and connect, for example, in our case, uh, every time you actually send us a job application, what's happening is that we create a GitHub issue. And what's really great about this is that um, our engineers are actually able to go and access it and very easily, you know, uh, comment back and forth. I'm not gonna show you anything because I think 
GDPR and stuff now. I may get in trouble. Um, but yeah, you basically get to, um, to just have like a GitHub issue and we actually work about it, argue about the salary, which is actually the first thing we recommend our, our new recruits to, uh, to check first day. Go check the issue so that you see the comments from the people who actually evaluated you and uh, uh, the back and forth around the salary, for example. It's not even legal in Europe. It's really annoying. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, bottom line is I fucking love Zapier and you can do a ton of that already out of box. Um, I'm gonna take one more second just to talk a little bit more about Zapier because I think it's actually a point a lot of people, um, it's something that I usually recommend to people who come to me asking like, hey, I wanna learn how to code. I wanna learn how to kind of like start building stuff. And you know, I was like, I, I, I want to go and join that thing, and I'm going to take like, you know, I'm going to do a bootstrap thing, and we're going to learn Python or Ruby on Rails. And I'm like, no, just don't, don't fucking do that. Just learn HTML and basic JavaScript. Uh, the reason being that you can already be very, you know, you can do some pretty cool stuff that is tangible, put it out there, and show it to other people. And on top of it, as soon as you start to get into backend thing, things get a lot more complicated in terms of getting that, that feedback loop of like reward of like, oh, I built something that is cool. If you, if you tell like a friend of yours that you built a really cool little Python script to do X, Y, and Z, it's not tangible. Nobody gives a fuck. If you show them a little page with like a form that you can submit things um, uh, to like and then create something in GitHub, it's a lot more tangible. So first, learn how to do basic HTML and CSS and JavaScript. Once you're able to actually build that little application and share it with other people, um, don't, don't learn how to code the backend yet, just really use Zapier. And even if you start learning some coding, uh, which we do in some cases, we have more complex like backend things that we do. Uh, you can always have like actually a step that is like no JS code, uh, I mean JavaScript code or, or Python code. So you can actually already like get acquainted with this without having to go and manage servers, without having to learn how to do things, for example, OAuth, which is really, really not super nice to deal with if you're a junior. Um, and, and you still get that reward of like that really instant value of like, hey, I did something that is useful to me or tangible for others or even useful to my team. Um, we automated a ton of things. Um, I won't show you, for example, but whenever we create a new repo on GitHub, there's actually, it, it, it hits a, a webhook on, on Zapier and then it runs a little Python script that actually sets our defaults uh, for the labels which is really annoying. You can't define the default labels in, in GitHub. So you have like those shitty labels nobody uses, on my team at least. Um, so we have, we have that and that runs on Zapier. Um, tons of things. We could host it on our own, but we decided not to. Um, a few more things. Uh, jQuery is rarely the answer now. It's not bad. jQuery is actually still pretty decent. Um, it's just not solving very interesting problems anymore. Uh, most of the things you can do with vanilla JavaScript and in, in almost all the cases, if you cross that threshold, you're probably better served by using something like Vue or React if you're, you know, masochist um, and, 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 and be done with it. Um, jQuery isn't even that relevant anymore, I feel. Um, I like micro frameworks. Um, so obviously Tachyons uh, is something we evaluated. Um, <laughs> that's the creator over there, right? Um, yeah. Um, it's, it's really good. Uh, I still wrote my own. <laughs> um, I have actually an additional point on that. Uh, I think um, most frameworks are really missing the point and they're trying to solve a ton of problems that are just super fucking irrelevant. Um, I get really mostly annoyed when people come to me and say, oh, but your framework doesn't solve grids. Who keeps a fuck, right? You're not the New York Times. You're not gonna have half a billion like layouts you're not gonna let an editorial team choose how they're actually gonna lay out a new page. In most cases, most websites, even on large scale, are gonna have like three, four templates with like, there's gonna be pages with a column on the left and then pages without a column on the left. And then maybe there's gonna be, you know, pages with like, you know, a little twiddly thing on the side or whatever, but there's no, not that many things. You don't need a fucking huge grid with like tons of combinations to be able to solve that problem. In most cases, you're actually much better served by just writing that, with like a few lines of codes, literally. So I tend to not solve uh, grids, at least not in a traditional sense. I have like, you know, a few things of that kind, but you can go check it out, it's open source as well. Uh, don't be a jerk, you know, just write comments. I know it's liquid and the common syntax is not super awesome, but you can still just spend the time of actually putting some code there. Um, same for JavaScript, same for HTML, same for CSS, just comment your code. 
other people are going to be maintaining it. Also, add readmes. Um, that's that's definitely an investment of time, right? But spend like the 30 minutes to an hour to actually write a proper readme for other people to maintain your code. Um, and then I spend a ton of time naming things properly and organizing my code. And I refactor that a lot, actually. I feel like it's actually probably one of the, the toughest thing in coding is really naming things properly. Once I've named things properly, I've thought about the concept hard enough that I actually know what it means and, 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 and you know, like what, what it does and what the constraints are. So I spend a lot of time on that, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, and as I said before, just say no and refactor the heck out of things. All right, last thing is about making Jekyll fast. Uh, the good news is actually I already wrote about it uh, for whatever. There was a Jekyll conference organized by the guys at Cloud Cannon, another better, I guess, somehow. Um, but um, yeah, I already wrote about it and already um, there's already a video online that you can go check. I mostly just trying to avoid plugins. I, by now, you actually know that I think they suck and you shouldn't use them. Um, loops are bad, just, just don't use them. Like try to avoid loops as much as possible. That's, that's where most of the time is gonna be spent uh, building your site. Um, use obviously an incremental build in Jekyll 3. Uh, that's great. Um, although it, it, you know, it's not always a, an awesome experience when you, know, you have some weird caching here and there. It's not perfect, but it definitely does speed things up. Uh, if you have a lot of posts and you just, especially if you're working locally, I usually just do like limit posts by one. Unfortunately, it doesn't support all the other kind of collections. It's only for posts, but you know, good enough, uh, at least for regular type of blog type of, of websites. Um, and then you can actually build a trace of your execution with profile. It's actually really useful when you don't really understand what the heck is going on. It's also not perfect, but it actually gives you a pretty decent understanding of like potentially, I actually log my, my traces every time we do a release on the websites and actually um, come back with those traces when there's an, an actual issue. Um, avoiding too many files, that's really just, uh, the core issue is really gonna be too many files in, in any static generator. Um, and that's why usually I use data, right? So again, for those of you who don't know, I only discovered that maybe a year ago because I'm a moron, but um, yeah, data is awesome. You can just like build a collection and uh, Actually, we just built that, that site for Zalando. It's actually like a really nice little site and we almost have no content apart from like a bunch of CSV files. So it, it's actually great for the client. You just tell them like, here's a spreadsheet, update the content, send it to me, and then you just export that in CSV, dump in a Jekyll and it works. And uh, it's got the, the side effect as well of like on being only one file for Jekyll to manage. So it's a little bit faster. Um, and then careful with config defaults. Again, I said that. I was very surprised uh, when I debugged that um, on, on that large website that we were building last year and then not understanding why suddenly it was taking close to a minute to build that website when it was like 16 seconds uh, you know, a few days before. And it's just because I had been like doing all that crazy overrides of overrides in defaults and I had like all those kind of crazy rules. And not only was it breaking, so this was like weird inconsistencies, but it was like way, way faster once I remove all that shit. And then that's just basically put a simple conditional test at the end of my file and then done. Um, so yeah, um, fast loading, obviously that's the other side. It's not the generation, but um, this, you know, it's well documented. Obviously use a CDN, Cloudflare is your friend. Optimize your pictures. You have tons of like little uh, tools that allow you to just optimize automatically the pictures. Um, resize your pictures. I sometimes use resize IO. Uh, I sometimes use like other um, online services to be able to do all the image manipulations on the fly. Inline your CSS, I do it sometimes, but not always. I actually don't really like doing that. I, I prefer to have the control of like a separate file. Um, and then go easy on scripts, especially if you start like loading all that jQuery crap, things can go wrong really fast. Um, and all the other shit that Google is advising you to do that. Although I would say, you know, it's pretty recent. I was surprised that checking their uh, google.com page because last year when I was doing the speed, the, I mean, when I was running that test on their own page, they were actually like maybe 60% or 70%. So I, I guess, you know, just take it with a grain of salt. Not everything is, uh, it's not, you know, must have. Uh, wrapping it up. So in a nutshell, 90% of what I talk today is actually in, in the boilerplate that I use uh, every time I start those projects, uh, Wirecraft slash Jekyll Basics. Um, it, it's really just like the starting point for all of our Jekyll projects. Um, we start from that boilerplate. We say no as often as possible and we keep things as simple as possible. So it's a lot of like no and why and are you sure and <laughs> just trying to avoid the maximum complexity. 
Uh, and the rest are pretty common best practices, right, around like coding, just naming things properly, organizing your code properly, running too many files. Um, so overall, what I find really interesting with Jekyll, uh, at least if I'm trying to get a conclusion out of this, is uh, I really like it because it imposes constraints, right? And it's, I think it's the right amount of constraints. It's got some amount of power and flexibility, but not too much. And, 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 and in that sense, it's actually, I think that's the, the great kind of like um, uh, uh, area in which, uh, you know, uh, you, you can be creative. Um, and, and I actually wrote more about it uh, online um, and, and how we apply this as well, not only to engineering, but as well to, uh, to design. Uh, but I think constraints are good. There's nothing worse than like blank canvas, do whatever you want. Uh, there's also nothing work than, worse than like you have to use PHP and you have to use this and you have to use that and it has to have this. So uh, that's usually why I like Jekyll, right? Um, that's basically it. Um, I don't know if I have really anything to illustrate further. Um, went through that. The Jekyll, uh, starbucks.com.cn, you can go online and there's more, more examples that I can give you. Jekyll Basics, I just talked about it. Those are the softwares that I already mentioned that you have the links and I'll put the slides online. Um, yeah, that's about it. Um, I can start with questions. Uh, where where do you host the, your static sites in China? Is it like, yeah, so it's always a mystery. I usually always start with GitHub pages because it's so easy. Um, and you don't have to think about it. Um, with that being said, there's a lot of things that are left to, you know, that are just not supported. Um, API proxying, if you want to avoid like core issues. And if you look at, for example, what we do for Starbucks, um, you know, we obviously have a ton of React that is embedded into it and we calling a lot of like third party services and you can, you know, you can log in and have access to loyalty, do payment and all those things, they're not obviously like supported out of the box and you want to avoid like, you know, maximum amount of like complexity. Um, redirecting um, um, files properly if you want to do 301s. Uh, it's not supported by Jekyll or very awkwardly. Um, so also password protection, right? Because sometimes you work on something you don't want to share with everybody. So what we did um, back in the day, actually, before we built Jekyll Plus, we had our own hosting solution that like a quick service we had put together called Jekyll Pro that we're still running for some of our clients um, that just does this. And uh, you have a little white YAML file that allows you to just go and um, define like some basic rules. Um, what's interesting with it is that it deploys automatically your, uh, all your branches. So if you go to, uh, I don't know if I have an example, but uh, probably the other day my team was QAing something for a campaign that we're running. And so we deploying um, at that URL, right? Which is, uh, yeah, that branch is actually found, found back into uh, the GitHub repo. And that's automatically handled by, uh, by our service. We've renamed that because we now had to go and twist it, make it work for Vue.js applications as well. And so we have a tiny service now that is called .yaml.com uh, that we're just like working on cleaning up and releasing. That does basically this plus any kind of other like static builds. So Vue.js, React, and whatnot. Um, and you just have to drop a file in your repo that is called uh, .yaml.yaml. Just that's the pun. Um, have you considered services like Netlify, for example? Because yeah, we play with doing it. All of that. Yeah, but it's uh, it's not great in China, and uh, we also um, I also don't love the in, the interaction with Netlify because it's heavily um, it's basically based on the assumption that you do all your administration of your hosting stuff in the interface, and the reality is in most cases for us at least it's mostly just more like you do with Travis CI, where you just say hey, I need to go and support that repo so that I can deploy it. But then after that, what happens in terms of like, oh, I need to set up redirections, I need to add passport protection, I need to do this and that, all those things, um, it's up to the developer to do it. And it's a lot easier for them to just manage that from their simple like YAML file. So that's kind of why we built our own thing. I find their UX a little bit awkward, to be honest. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a super solid product, definitely. Wow. I was that boring. Hi, hey. uh, thanks for a great talk. Yeah. I have short two questions. First question may be stupid, but do you use Jekyll assets? No, I don't like plugins. Okay, so. <laughs> and 
honestly, so what do you do with Jekyll assets? Do you, do you minify stuff? Do you, what do you do with it? You kind of have quick access uh, to your images, whatever, CSS with one line. So you don't actually care about u the URLs where they are. So I've never run into a problem where, I mean, as long as you start properly organizing your code, that's the thing. It's, it's, I, I know you can find convenience into using um, those modules. I'm not saying there's not a case for it. And I'm not saying nobody should use them. If you want to go and use them, just use them. Uh, in most cases, I'm, I'm just perfectly fine with having, um, I can't find one, uh, but let's see. Like see the layout. Is there a layout around here? There you go. Um, that's not mine. Right, so I'm perfectly fine with doing this. And it works. I've never broken that. Every time somebody came to me and said, oh, it doesn't work, it's like, yeah, because she's doing stupid shit, man. And as soon as you start using overrides, because it doesn't work, then you say, oh, well, but yeah, but when I'm on my local, then it doesn't work. It's like, well, use overrides, you moron, because you can actually go and set your local host 4,000 when you're on your local. And what I do in my make file here, because I don't want to type that shit every time, is just like make serve, and it serves my file, um, my, my website with the right configuration. So I've never had like a, a case where I was like, I definitely need to use a module for that. And the only case where I really felt like I'm gonna probably need to use a module was um, multilingual support. And then I used one and it was terrible. And I used another one and it was terrible as well. There was like all kind of wacky shit. Uh, I also hate the pager, by the way. It's probably one of the things that is the worst implementation in, in Jekyll. But um, I, I couldn't find a single, a single case where it's like definitely, yes, you gotta, you gotta go and use a module. Even recently with the SEO module, just realizing on like even our small website that only has like maybe 400 pages that um, that it was slowing down the build significantly, not by a small margin, but significantly slowing down the build. And it was like SEO, really? That's supported by GitHub pages. Everybody uses it. Um, so yeah, no. Okay. Yeah, I was asking because actually I hate it as well, but I didn't find a better yeah! solution. Yeah, hate prevail. <laughs> yeah, the second question is, um, where actually do you store the index of lunar js um so it depends um in some of the more complex cases we have to go and do something that is a little bit more complicated so i'm going to take the complex case first and then i'm going to come back to the easier one that is probably how you're actually going to do it so um and i'm trying to clean it up so that i can write a proper blog post that explains to people like actually how to do search and how to also manage like indexes in multiple languages um, because most of what I build with Jekyll now is like 80% boilerplate and then 20%, well, maybe not, 60% boilerplate. But there's more than half of the projects when I work, I just don't have to do anything because I already have like that library of all those little plugins and especially all the stuff around SEO, I hate having to fiddle with that. Um, so in some cases, if I take um, this bigger website, I'm probably in assets somewhere, I have something that is related to search and then I have those um, JSON files, right? And it's gonna be a little bit more comp, yeah, that's not a good idea. That's a generated um, thing. So that's not gonna be good, but uh, yeah, this one is a template, right? So I generate that JSON object and, and then I retrieve it from, um, I actually first, this one is tokenized because like Chinese language is fucked and you have to go and do some weird stuff to make it work for search. Um, but then from the search script, which is somewhere, I don't know, man. Um, I actually just go, no, that's the Armin. I don't know. Yeah, we actually, I still haven't refactored that stuff. We have two scripts, one for Chinese and one for English, just because edge cases. Um, and I, I retrieve the JSON file from here, right? And then I build, like I just load it and then I have my index and then I do things. Now, in most cases though, I don't do that at all. Uh, what I actually use is probably I can see it from the team repo, which is our playbook, right? Because that's obviously the repo we use for communicating. That's basically our intranet, right? But if you go to um, the search script, you actually just build the index right there and don't even bother. But this was exactly my question. You answered my sub question, thanks. Uh, so if you store all this shit, like you say, in window, in uh, object, it can be, kind of destructive for a uh, client side? Well, I mean, again, 
we're not talking about a hundred thousand or a million objects. In most cases, if you're reaching like, you know, tens of thousands of entries, you're probably already going to be struggling with other problems anyway with, uh, with your website. In most cases, Jekyll may not even be the right answer for you at that stage, right? Because it's really hard to generate a site with, you know, over a thousand is already a threshold you have to get. But if you've ever tried to do 10,000, good luck, buddy. Um, so I think you'll hit other problems to solve before you do the search stuff. And Lunar is not going to be great at doing that either because you're going to have that massive object you need to go and, and, and traverse when you want to do the search. It's not good. Um, at that stage, you're probably better served with having like a, a, a microservice that, you know, proxy to mm -hmm. Elasticsearch or something else, right? Maybe Argolia then makes sense, right? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions? No? Everybody's bored. That's amazing. We're down here kind of being French. No. The beer drinking guy over there. <laughs> no? No, you were, you were greeting your friend. Okay, I, I think there's a question there. Hello, thanks for the talk. I don't know Jekyll at all, so I don't know what liquids are. Can you explain that a bit? The what, sorry? What are liquids? Oh, liquid. Liquid is a, a templating engine um, that was developed by Shopify. Um, and it, it's just basically the, the, the template engine that we use uh, in, in Jekyll. Um, it's pretty simple. It's like double curly bracket and curly bracket with percentages. It's nothing fancy. Um, sorry? Yeah, so that's shit here. That's, that's just Jekyll, uh, but that's, that's liquid inside. Um, keep in mind as well, I mean, I've used a lot of templating engines, and we used to do work with Metalsmith. Uh, we've used Hugo, obviously. We use like other alternatives. And I've always come back to Liquid as being, I don't know what exactly it is. I think it's maybe like the, the way that you can do like the, you know, the parent uh, uh, templating stuff and the way the boxing model works. Uh, it's, it's pretty great. That's the best experience I've had so far building static uh, websites. If you've never used it, definitely just go and create a GitHub page and, and dig around with it for, you know, half a day. I think you'll like it. What do you use? ERB. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Anybody else? If there's no more questions, we can take a five minute break and then we move to the next talk. All right. Um, yeah.